so uh, thank you for coming. Um, so my talk is titled uh, Deferrable Operators in the Amazon Provider Package. Uh, so first off, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Syed Hussain. Um, I work um, with AWS as a software developer in the MWAA open source team. Uh, for a lot of the last year, I've been working on writing deferrable operators for the Amazon provider package. Um, and now I'm starting to switch over to working on custom executors for the Amazon provider package. So first off, just before we start talking about how we implemented deferrable operators, um, let's talk a little bit more about why we want to defer in the first place. And to do that, um, we need to first off talk a little bit about how Airflow runs a task. And the way it does is um, Airflow uh, has a task to run. It creates a task instance and then passes that task instance off to the scheduler. And the scheduler does whatever processing it needs to do and then hands that task off to the executor, uh, which runs it to its completion. And if that task happens to be like a type of task that makes full use of the resources that the workers allocated, then you know, great. There's not really nothing that needs to be done there. Everything's working as um, as planned, as expected. But a lot of the times, we have tasks that do a little bit of config in the beginning. They'll set things up. They'll create some connections, whatnot, and then they'll set, submit a job to a third party uh, cluster, it's like an EMR cluster, an ECS cluster, something like that. Um, and then they'll wait for that job to be completed on that third party. And then once that job is completed, they'll come back and resume. Um, but during the entire duration of while that job is running on that third party, this task is sitting on the resources that was allocated and it's not doing anything with it. It's, it's, it's sitting idle and essentially just pulling every now and then. But for the most part, it's sitting idle and, and taking up the resources that it was allocated. And so obviously wasting resources comes down to wasting money. You've paid for those resources, those resources that were allocated to that task, you're paying for that. And if you're not using that, you're wasting that money. So this is where deferrable operators come in. And deferrable operators, uh, simply put, uh, is an operator that is written with the ability to suspend itself during its execution and free up that worker slot that it was, uh, it was occupying. And the way it does this internally is it passes off, it tears itself down and passes off that the responsibility of, of resuming it to what's called a trigger. And the trigger is uh, an asynchronous Python piece of Python code that runs on a process called the trigger. And what that trigger does is it pulls whatever service that that, wait, that operator is waiting on. It'll continuously pull it periodically over, over whatever um, uh, schedule you set it up for. And once, it, once it, the condition is met for resuming the operator, it will, it, will, it will come back to the scheduler and the scheduler will pick up that operator from where it left off. And, and the whole thing will, will run um, as, as before. Uh, so for this, consider the uh, EMR serverless start job operator. This is an operator in the Amazon provider package. Um, as the name suggests, it starts a job on the EMR serverless um, application. And the prerequisites for this operator is that you need an application, an EMR serverless application, and some config for the job that you want to run. And what the operator does is it gets that, it, it makes sure that that application that you provided it exists, and it makes sure that the status of that application is started. And if that happens to be the case, then it starts a job and everything works in one, in one, uh, one, one straight line. But if that application happens to not be started for whatever reason, if it's not in a started state, this, what this operator does is internally, it'll start the application and it will wait within the operator until that application is in the state that it needs to be in, and then it starts the job. And this is a good example of within an operator, a good place where you'd want to defer. And the EMR serverless start job, uh, start job operator waits for the application to start, and this process takes maybe a minute to two minutes, three minutes, something like that. It's a very, fairly relatively short um, term, but this same concept can be applied to, say, the EMR add steps operator, which is something that which is an operator that adds a step to a, to a running EMR job. And that step can be an arbitrarily long step. And so 
what we want to do is defer when we st when we've started that step and however ma however many hours it takes for that for that job to run we want to wait with the trigger and then resume once the job is completed and why is that useful a trigger is a process that's running that can potentially handle up to hundreds th uh, up to thousands of triggers at at the same time simultaneously and the reason for that is because triggers are written in asynchronous Python code, and they're by definition very lightweight. They're made to, be, to coexist with other triggers and written in a way that they don't get in each other's way. And by comparison, worker slots are a much more expensive resource. They're a much more limited resource. So if we can free up worker slots and move the workload onto a trigger, without affecting DAG execution, then we, we, we cut down on a lot of uh, resources and save a lot of money. So what are our goals for writing the deferrable operators? It was to provide users with tools that they need to run their DAG in a more cost efficient and resource efficient manner. And ideally what you'd want is we take every operator that we have in our package and support deferrable mode for them. But realistically, that's not possible and really not necessary either. Consider the S3 operators versus the Redshift operators. S3 operators have, have operations like creating a bucket, tagging a bucket, deleting a bucket, etc. cetera. Um, whereas Redshift operators have operations like creating clusters, deleting clusters, creating snapshots of cl clusters, and other, things, other operations related to the Redshift cluster. And realistically speaking, an S3 operation is more or less instantaneous. It might take maybe a few seconds, up to a minute or two, if there's network delays and whatnot, but it's more or less an instantaneous operation. Whereas if you, if you think about how long a Redshift cluster takes to provision, that's usually in the order of five to 10 minutes um, generally. And so not all operators need deferrable mode equally. And so the way we came up with our plan of attack, the, the priority that we um, the went with was we selected operators based on their usage versus how suitable they were for deferrable mode. And we came up with a list of operators that we wanted to address first. Before we started writing code, um, we went through an extensive planning phase. Um, and I want to take you through some of the, the key elements that we wanted to stick to for, the, for rolling out our deferrable operators. And the first one was to enforce a single code base. It's very easy and very tempting when writing deferrable operators to, is to take an existing operator and make an asynchronous version of that same operator. So if you have a Redshift create cluster operator, it's very tempting and very, uh, intuitive to take and make an asynchronous redshift create cluster operator. Um, it's very easy to do that, but what, what happens um, as you go down that line is you end up essentially maintaining two code bases. If there's a ma major refactor to the synchronous version, you need to make sure that, that the asynchronous version also gets that same refactor and that same level of testing. And that just leads to maintainab maintainability issues down the line. And tying back to this, that first point is we wanted to maximize code reuse. So there's a lot of code that's been written by the community and has been tested that does a lot of the underlying, underlying uh, validation and, and, and connections, uh, it's setting up connections that we wanted to reuse. Because again, we don't, we don't want to reinvent the wheel when we're, when we're coming up with these uh, deferrable operators. So we wanted to make sure we're, we're making use of, of, of a lot of the, as much as possible, the existing code. And we wanted to have a strong parallel between synchronous and asynchronous operators. This, again, kind of really ties to the first two points where we wanted, we didn't want an asynchronous operator to be something that's totally brand new, totally out of, out of the out of expectation of what a, an operator should look like. We wanted to take an idea of what users are comfortable with, uh, existing synchronous operators, and really have a, have a very parallel way of making the asynchronous operators. And lastly, we wanted to have a common pattern across all operators. Um, and I, I, by that, I mean across all deferrable operators. So if you look at any, a single one of our deferrable operators and you compare it to another operator, you'll see that 
there are a lot of commonalities and that's by design. We wanted to make it so that there's a single way to write the deferrable operators so that if you see one, you're kind of familiar, you would have an idea of what, the other, what other operators would look like. Some of the challenges that we had during implementation was um, Bodo Core, uh, which is the library that makes the calls, makes all the calls to the AWS services. It does not support asynchronous operations natively. So basically within every operator and every hook, we make calls to the AWS uh, API and that's done through the Bodo Core library and that does not support asynchronous operations natively. So we had to look for a third party solution. Uh, we, can, we came uh, up using AIO Bodocore. Um, that's a community driven project, uh, basically aimed at replicating the functionality of Bodocore with using asynchronous operation. Another, another challenge that we uh, ran into right from the first PR was Airflow's lack of support for asynchronous DBIO operations. So the whole premise of running triggers is that they're all asynchronous and that's how they can coexist with each other. But Airflow doesn't support asynchronous DBIO operations. And so there is a little bit of locking down the event loop when, when the triggers are run because we're making calls to the DB. And this was something, there was a lengthy discussion about it on, on GitHub and ultimately what, what the community and we decided were, was that despite this limitation, it's still very valuable to have deferrable operators supported. And during our testing, we, we saw this, that when we run uh, triggers, we do see the event loop getting tied down for about 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 seconds on average. Um, and if you compare that to you know, an EMR job that's running for, you know three hours, that, that time that we've lost is, is negligible. So where are we now? Currently we have 49 operators and sensors that support deferrable mode. Um, and when I said earlier that not all deferrable operators and, and, and sensors need to support deferrable mode equally, the, the operators that I've listed here, the EMR, ECS, SageMaker, Glue, these are the operators that tend to have very long run, run times. EMR jobs, SageMaker jobs, when you're training uh, um, machine learning algorithms, these, these can take hours to run. And we want to support these as fast as possible. And currently all, for, all four of those operators are su uh, supported amongst others. I wanna talk a little bit about the project lessons and insights. Um, and the first of which is planning really pays off. And that's not really something new, that's not really something that's, that's groundbreaking, but it really shows how much initial planning can really save time down the line and how much the benefits of planning really compound over time. We, we spend a lot of time in the initial, in initial stages t thinking about the potential scenarios we would run into, th thinking about potential problems we'd run into, and we, we came up with uh, strategies to deal with them. And, it showed in our implementation that when we eventually ran into those problems, we had ideas on how to solve them. And another, another insight is to really adopt an iterative approach. And that's kind of almost counter to what the first point is, where no matter how much you plan, no matter how much you come up with scenarios, you'll always run into something that you didn't consider before. And it's really important to be able to realize that something's not working, something can be improved, and you clean up and you refactor as you're going through the process. And that sometimes does cause delays during the implementation, during the rolling out of the operators. But if you look at the timeline of how we implemented our deferrable operators, initially we were, we were taking, there were, there were periods of days between subsequent PRs. But near the ending, we were, it was almost on a daily basis that we were, we were pushing on new PRs because of how, how much we had refined the process to the point where it was almost um, trivial to, to, to convert a deferrable operator. And lastly, really Airflow is a open source community-based project. So it really makes sense to engage the community early on and be as transparent as possible in the decision making. A lot of the problems that we ran into, some of the problems that I mentioned, the solutions were suggested by the community and at times even implemented by others in the community. So it really pays off to, to have that initial community engagement and pays off, that, pay, that effort pays off down the line. 
Some of the future work that we want to uh, work on is integrate differable operators into our system tests. So we have system tests in our AWS um, provider package. These tests are essentially integration tests that run um, automatically every time there's a new change in the code base. And we want to essentially use differable, integrate differable operators into that so that any errors that are somehow missed during um, the code review process and the Airflow CI, they get caught with our integration tests. Um, another one is to help out with the AIO Bodocore release cycles. Like I mentioned, AIO Bodocore is a community-driven open source project, and we want to help take on some of the load of keeping up with the releases. Bodocore is um, a, a library that is uh, updated almost uh, daily. AIO Bodocore obviously can't match that, so we want to help out with some of the um, effort required to, to help maintain that project. And then lastly, we want to expand support for op other operators and sensors. Um, I, I mentioned that we had 49 operators done. That, that accounts for a large percentage of our usage, but there are other operators that, that we'd like to support as well. And so we'd like, we'd like to eventually take those on as well. And at the end of all this, what can you do with this? So our entire method and process is documented on GitHub. And it's something that we did by, by design, that we wanted our discussions to be public. We wanted to make sure that our decision-making process, our reasonings for the decisions that we made was all documented in a public forum for the community to, to look through. And the, uh, the reason behind that is because it's an open source project. We want to make sure that this is something that the community adopts, that the community understands the decisions that we made. And what we'd, what we'd like to see from this is we'd like to see the community writing deferable operators for the Amazon provider package. It's, we've set up a very thorough framework for, for writing them. And if you, if you have an, an operator that you'd like to see um, implement deferable mode and you see that it has not done so already, then it's, it's, it's very straightforward to get started on that. Mm -hmm. And that idea doesn't necessarily mean only, that this method doesn't necessarily work only for, defer for the Amazon provider package. The, the methodology that we've implemented is universal. It can be applied to any provider package. So any, any type of provider package operator that you, wanna, you want to see supported, you can get started on that as well. And lastly, we want to improve the process. So like, when I mentioned my first point, our entire process is documented. And we want to, we've adopted from early on an iterative ap approach. And so the only way you can improve that process is to go through that process. So we'd like to see the community start writing operators, start writing uh, operators for the Amazon provider package, for other provider packages, and engage with us on Slack and on GitHub and ultimately improve that process. And that's everything. Thanks, Ed. Uh, any questions from the audience? Can you talk more, thank you for the talk. Um, can you describe more how deferable operators actually work in, in the way that they interact with the trigger and uh, like how state is stored in, in any of these? Like I'm interested in the machinery behind the, the operator. Uh, so that's a good point. State is actually not stored at all in deferable operators. Um, the idea behind it is that they're very, they're supposed to be very highly available. Um, Basically, when you defer, uh, when you when you call the self dot defer method on an in an operator, you pass it a list of information basically that the that that can be stored in the database for that trigger, and only that is what the next time the idea of a trigger is that essentially it can be torn down at any point and pick up from where it left off using the same information that it, that it was stored in. Um, so. Yeah, it basically, there's no there's no state uh, that a trigger, by definition, can't really uh, measure state. Um, you give it an initial initial set of instructions to to build it up, and it, it needs only that. And the idea behind it is that it's meant to be uh, primarily like a, a polling mechanism, meaning you know we, it's it's meant to be lightweight. It's meant to have long pauses in between so that other other triggers other triggers can uh, can can run, run alongside. So is it is it functionally like uh, one can think of it conceptually like as a 
uh, operator and sensor pair that works together. Yeah, like, I guess the example, oh my God, sorry. Uh, the example being like, okay, so I've triggered an EMR job. Like what happens then? The EMR cluster like lets the thing know or it's being pulled or, yeah. Yeah, so um, eventually the idea is that if an operator does support um, deferable mode, then the, well, so I mean, the idea behind a sensor is that it does, it, it can sense multiple states. It doesn't need to sense only the completed state. So you can have a deferable, uh, uh, a sensor sense that the, uh, uh, that the job is currently running. That's one of the things that a sensor um, supports. Whereas when we implement deferable operators, it's, you know, we're only waiting for that job to complete. We don't really care if it's, we can't really know if it's, you know, in, in the running state or if it's in the queued state or whatnot. Any states in between, we only care about one specific state. Um, and yeah, so in that case, it actually does take the job of the, of the sensor. And um, you mentioned polling. Um, the way that works is that um, in the sensor itself, in the trigger itself, you would write a hook to, to pull the EMR server, EMR server service. And it would it would call that hook and then sleep asynchronously, um, so it, it would need to be an asynchronous call to the to the to the service and then an asynchronous sleep, and yeah, essentially it, it just does that for whatever in a while loop until it reaches the condition that you want it to reach, and then um, it passes back off to the to the operator. Any other questions? Hi, hi Sayed. Um, thanks for that talk. We at Etsy have also been working on. Uh, making a lot of our operators deferrable as well. And one thing that we've had some problems with is uh, sometimes we'll, we'll change an operator to deferrable and then we'll, we'll see that there are some warnings like there's, uh, like you said, the DB call, there's a async, but the, the synchronous thread is being blocked for a couple seconds or whatever. Uh, we, we use ASGIREF a lot to sync to async to, to convert a lot of the synchronous calls to async. Can you talk about some of the ways that you've debugged uh, blocking on the on the, the synchronous thread? Yeah, so that's something that's like notoriously hard about um, asynchronous operations. That it's, it's it's very very difficult to figure out where the blockage is coming from, and realistically, it just boils down to you know really really strong debugging because um, there's um, even in the within the uh, there, like that watchdog mechanism that, that Airflow has internally to determine whether um, the event loop is being blocked, it can't really, t it can't tell where that blockage is coming from. It can only tell that that event loop was blocked, but not from where, where it was coming from. And so, yeah, realistically, I, like, it just comes down to really uh, uh, combing through the code and figuring out where um, the network calls are coming from. So. Uh, there are, you know, the, the likely likely culprits are things like network calls, things like DB operations and file reads and, and that type of stuff. Realistically, that's like, you just have to kind of really go uh, comb through the code and find out instances of where that's happening and see whether that could be the problem. Um, hi, sorry, could you talk a little bit about how like the preemption works with deferable operators. So like if you give up your worker to some, some other task to run and then, and then the trigger comes and says like, now it's your turn to run. So like how, how does, do you like, do you go on a queue to like restart again or do you preempt the worker that you originally was there? Or you took your slot? Yeah, so it does um, essentially the, when, when the trigger, um, is, is ready to give it back to the operator, then the operator is put back into, onto the queue. And um, ideally, if you're running multiple triggers and every uh, thing within your workflow is deferrable, you would have you would have the case where you'd have empty slots read, readily available because everything's or more most things are running on the trigger, waiting for whatever state to happen. And um, yeah, it gets popped back onto the queue, and uh, um, the operator picks up from where it left off. I haven't, I haven't used this yet, so I'm curious. Uh, the main, I think, uh, benefit of using deferrable operators is that it doesn't consume a whole worker when you do that, right? How does that work? Why doesn't it consume a whole worker? Aren't you still using compute to do the polling? Yeah, you are, but that compute is being uh, is done, that process is running on a separate process called the trigger, and the trigger is running asynchronous Python code. All right. 
And so because it's asynchronous and because of the limitations that we put on things like, you know, no state information is being uh, stored and all that uh, uh, and, uh, and a few other restrictions, um, these processes are, are by definition very lightweight and they're, they're made to coexist with other, other, um, other triggers in, in, in asynchronously. So is that trigger like a much smaller machine than a worker or what, why is that trade-off worth it? Yeah, so the trigger is essentially um, in a single host, you can hold, you can run potentially hundreds of triggers. And so it, it's worth it because instead of taking a beefy worker slot that, you know, meant to do compute work and um, essentially being used to pull something, you're taking that and putting it into a place that can, um, one, coexist with hundreds of other, other similar operations and, you know, freeing up that that beefy work, worker slot for something that actually needs it. When you talked about executing the project, you mentioned keeping the synchronous and asynchronous code bases all in the same place. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Does that mean that like you would essentially convert, use asynchronous for all operations on a specific operator? Or can you describe that more? Uh, so, so it boils down to basically a flag that we've implemented in the when, when you're calling that operator, similar to, for example, if you have um, some of the operators on in the Amazon provider package had some had a flag called wait on completion. Um, and that was essentially, um, you know, just a little flag that you tag on to the operator. And it, 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 if that was true, then you would go into a different uh, branch of the code. Uh, we've kind of done something similar we, we, where we've added deferable tagged onto that thing. And so if you set deferable to true, it just calls that defer um, self.defer method and then jumps into the trigger code. 